we know that there's so many different factors that are going on and at all different levels. And we can't necessarily intuit all those things, and we'll talk about intuition later because we do use it a lot and train ourselves in it. But we need to be able to work with the body and set up things uh, so that the body can heal, improve communication, and get the body working in a different way. And to do that, we need to also be able to ask the body and communicate with the body. And um, that way we're actually allowing the innate wisdom of the body to design the treatment. So in fact, the Body Talk Healthcare is where the healthcare system is actually designed by your own body. And we follow directions from the body. And I'll talk about that and explain that. And we do know the body can self-heal. And the innate communicates with you in many forms, including symptoms, pain, and pleasure. What we're saying is there is an innate intelligence in the body. There is this um, ability of the body to heal itself. And this innate intelligence is an interesting one because in uh, traditional medicine, they tend not to look at it, even though we know that uh, the mystery of the body is incredible. How things heal is often way beyond normal explanations in physiology and biochemistry. In fact, how a lot of things occur. And uh, I remember years ago when I was learning uh, embryology at university, and um, the lecturer was up there and we're talking about conception and fetal development. And they talk about the two little um, cells that get together in the middle of the night up there. We won't tell you how they got together. We're in Canada, we can't talk about things like that. But um, when they do get together, then you start dividing. That big cell starts dividing up and dividing up until it gets to 64 cells. And, and then those cells start branching out and each one is going to become part of your body. Some's going to become the kidneys, others the brain, others the heart, and so on. And then, lo and behold, within a very short period of time, you have this fetus forming. And the lecturer is saying, you know, this is what happens, and this is what happens, and this is what happens. So I put my hand up, you know, excuse me, sir. That, you're telling me what's happening, but how do the cells know where to go? Why would they bother doing it in the first place? You know, just, just a simple question, how and why? And he said, son, you're in medicine, doing medicine now. You don't ask how and why. We'll tell you what happens. If you want to know how and why, study philosophy. Right? Especially when it comes to this, because that was the big thing. What drives them? What tells them? What's going on? And something so unique as the human body, if you really think about it, all happening like that, it, it isn't on some autopilot, there is directions. They've now found in intensive studies, they've actually can measure in a blueprint that there's actually around the blastosphere an actual blueprint of a baby that's about um, uh, 15 weeks old actually forms. So it acts, there, it's an electromagnetic blueprint, so it gives guidelines a bit like birds use electromagnetic fields on Earth to be able to know where to fly. And um, they've done studies on that at the Macquarie University in Sydney and London University. They did studies of um, a tadpole. And they got the tadpole and they photographed it with this high energy photography. And they could get the outline of a fully grown frog around the tadpole as an electromagnetic field. So we'll call that like a blueprint. And, what was, and of course that was the blueprint, the tadpole, which has to turn into a frog, uh, which is just as mysterious, could grow. And um, then they did an interesting thing. They bombarded the electromagnetic field around where the legs are and shot it with electrons to break it up and damage it a bit. The frog didn't, the tadpole just kept growing. But when it was grown into a frog, it had fully mutilated and damaged legs. So, you know, by altering the, the blueprint, changed the outcome. Right? And um, so that's starting to show some of the answers. But we still know that throughout the body there is this innate knowing, this innate wisdom. And um, this innate wisdom is something that we can communicate with. It's a knowing, it's part of consciousness. 
In fact, it's um, directed, we can say, by a higher consciousness, which these days in most um, metaphysical studies and philosophies we say is found in the heart, or the heart brain. And um, this is also the part that gives us the intuition as well. And we're going to talk about that in a second. At this stage, figuring out what's going on, we want to have this communication. And when we first start in body talk, we do a form of like biofeedback, which has been around a long time. We know that we can get, um, do things with the body and get a feedback technique. We can change temperature levels in our fingers just by using our mind. And we also know in things like applied kinesiology, we can do what they call muscle testing. And you can test a person's, say, grip strength. And if you use a, a machine and show they've got a 50 pound grip strength, if you put something they're allergic to, right, just against their skin, their grip strength will suddenly drop from 50 pound to 20 pound. They actually get weak. And often lasting for about a minute or so until their body works out a way of overcoming that and gets its strength back. But therefore, if you test it, either by grip strength or even simpler just doing a muscle test, you can actually try all different products out to find out what weakens your body, in other words, what you're allergic to. This is the original concept behind uh, kinesiology, applied kinesiology, um, which is something I studied for a long time. Um, and it uh, was the original type of understanding that we can get feedback from the body. And it can be very accurate feedback. In body talk, we tend to, in the early stages, we use a form of that, but not muscle testing so much, but we can get what we call a yes-no answer and establish a yes-no answer by several different methods that we can train you in so that we can ask, ask literally, instead of putting something on, we can ask questions and get an answer from the innate wisdom. And when we've practiced it, for a bit, we start getting a lot of accuracy. Uh, this is a developed, and then we find that over a period of time, that if you start developing that ability and realize that we all have intuition, we have very powerful intuition. But our biggest problem is it's not always reliable. People think of intuition as just not being reliable. And the reason is we haven't understood it. We haven't trained it. Um, well, we haven't trained our own mind to understand the intuition. Actually, everyone has perfect intuition. That's the, we'll call that the higher self. It's our ability to understand it through our filters, through, our, through what's going on. And that's why you have to develop it, that understanding through what we call left brain and right brain activity. The right brain activity is the creativity and intuition coming in, and the left brain is the knowledge we have, the knowledge and understanding and wisdom and when you put those two together, you get what we call structured intuition. A lot of people, when they start out in things, even when they're doing body talk, quite a few body talkers here, and you start doing these yes and no's, and you'll hear them saying, gee, I don't know if I can trust this, it might be my imagination. You know? And of course, my answer to them is, yes, it is your imagination. Very much so, because studies have shown that the area of the brain, that where your imagination is, is exactly the same area where your intuition emits from. The difference is, intuition is structured imagination. It's structured in a way that you're putting it through filters to ensure that it's accurate, right? And we teach how to set up those filters in Body Talk. And that comes from the studies I did long before Body Talk in studying how the mind works even through my teens and everything, I did a lot of martial arts and, and training, meditation and all that type of thing. And I developed this system called Mindscape, which we still teach. I've been teaching now for 30 years. Um, where we can apply structures in the brain to filter through the intuition and uh, get it accurate. And as such, then, a lot of information you can get. So, for example, when we talk about structured and filters. When I, years ago when I was teaching Mindscape, I teach to lay people and people from all sorts of backgrounds. And I remember teaching a course and um, at the end of the course, we used to test them out. And what we used to do, I, I used to do medical things because of my background, and would have the, the student, after being trained for two days, they'd be given the name and uh, date of birth 
and country that someone lives in that they've never met, say someone in Switzerland, right? And they're told to use that to tune into them and to bring them in what they call their workshop. And then to bring them out of what we call a lift in front of them and then sort of to reach out and start feeling what's going on. And what happens is they start, the more they do it, the more they start feeling. And they'll say, oh, they've got a missing finger or they've got this and oh, well, they've got kidney stones and so on. And we find even the first time they do it, they get about 60% accuracy, which is way beyond coincidence when it's the whole body. And I remember one of our guys who, quite brilliant in, intuitively, but his background was he was a builder. He built houses. And uh, we, I gave him a woman and he's going out and I said, what's going on? His name is John. He said, oh, um, it's all in a pelvis. I said, yeah, what's going on there? He says, well, she's got two tanks and a drain pipe, a really bad drain pipe all over the place. I said, two tanks and a drain pipe. Well, that could, you know, I knew that could be kidneys, bladder, ureter, or it could be ovaries, uterus, and floping tubes. So I said, okay, describe the top tank. And he said, oh, smallish, ovalish, lots of eggs inside. <laughs> okay. And the bottom one, he says, oh, it looks like a pear upside down with a big hole up the center. <laughs> okay. So we had a fallopian, we had an ovary and a, a uterus. I said, well, what's going on? He says, well, it's got a really lousy drain, drain pipe, badly designed, it's all over the place. And what's more, things have got stuck. He's got a big mass of rubbish in the center of it. Right now, it turns out later when we opened the envelope, um, she had an ectop ectopic pregnancy, right? That had died and, you know, but it's, that was medical. But from his point of view, it was a big clump of rubbish, right? And you know, that was his, he was accurate, right? He knew what was going on, but he didn't have the words to be able to describe it from the, the filters of medicine. He used the filters of building. And you wouldn't have liked his treatment probably, because I said, well, how would you address it? And he said, I'd get one of those big um, plumber's uh, <laughs> things and get inside and ram, ram it out. And, uh, but what it showed is that, yes, a lot of the reasons our intuition isn't accurate is because we don't have the right filters to be able to understand what it's trying to tell us. That's why if you want medical, be a medical intuitive as it were, you have to know something about medicine, about the body. But we have people who can be very intuitive about engines or many other different aspects of life. But it does require discipline and training in order to get the left and right brain so you have structured intuition that's accurate. And that's what we do with Buddy Talk, so that we can get accurate information from the body through the intuition, so that we can then design the appropriate formulas and treatments to correct the problem. Okay, where are we? Steve Jobs. Intuition is a very powerful thing, more powerful than intellect, in my opinion. That's had a big impact on my work. I began to realize that an intuitive understanding and consciousness was more significant than abstract thinking and intellectual logical analysis. Steve Jobs, one of the most successful, he's the guy from Apple, that was one of the most successful CEOs of all time. Let's uh, not take notice of him, let's talk to someone who's really smart. Whoops, go back. Go back. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Albert Einstein. And I would point out that all the greatest scientists in the world, and I've, it, Einstein's and Tesla's from old and everything, they, and including modern scientists, ones I meet, I, I go to many scientific conferences and I meet some of the big names, the Nobel Prize winners and everything like that. And when we talk about advancements, uh, and developments, their great discoveries that got them the Nobel Prize. They point out that in 95% of cases, they do not happen in laboratories. That sometimes the laboratory sets up the structure for them and can set up a certain left brain framework for them, but invariably, the, it comes through intuition. And it's usually when they're walking along the beach or under the shower, Well, interestingly, the majority of cases was when they were sitting on the toilet interesting information uh, and um, because they come intuitively.
But the difference is, they get an intuitive flash, they know how to interpret it. A good friend of mine, Elizabeth Rausch, a brilliant mathematician, and um, when she made some of the break, big breakthroughs in mathematics, as she said, it'll just come to me, you know, it just comes intuitively while I'm just sitting looking at a sunset or something. But it comes to her as a big mathematical formula. Well, of course, it came to, if that came to me, I wouldn't have a clue what it was. It would just be a jumble. You know, I'd say something crazy came. Because I don't have that language, you see. And hence, I don't have the filters for that. So intuition has to be trained and you have to have the filters. But when you do, and which is what we do in Body Talk, and we train you well, then you become accurate. And you can be very useful in, in not only in helping people, but in your own life. So in Body Talk, we have many different courses, both from the technical aspect of Body Talk to the concepts of Mindscape to develop the intuition and um, Breakthrough, which helps us to understand belief systems and how they accumulate and how they affect us. And um, of course, we also have our animal talk as well. So it's a, a very broad scope of learning to bring all the pieces together, not only for healthcare, but also just for your life. About 40% of the people who have trained in body talk over the years doing all the courses have never treated anyone. They're successful in other, other careers and don't intend to practice, but they do it because of what they've learned about life and how, the, how things work and how the body works and understanding themselves, which can be very important, personal development in what we call increasing awareness. One of the things that happen when you, um, the intuition starts coming in, you go in what we call the zone. And zoning is, um, you know, becoming a very popular word nowadays because you see many people when they go in the zone, where, for example, sports people will go in the zone. And when they're in the zone, they're just in a different place. Everything changes. What they see, you know, they talk about it, that suddenly everything slows down. And there's just, they're playing basketball and it's not them playing basketball, just basketball is being played. And it's like in slow motion and everything's very, very clear. Michael Jordan described it. I was in a groove. I was in a rhythm that I can, can't really explain. I started hitting threes like they were free throws. The rim seemed like a big old huge bucket and I can't miss it. After a while I just looked at Marv, Albert and Magic Johnson and those guys just said, what can I say? It's not me, it's just the moment. And of course we know Michael Jordan was one of the reasons he was one of the greatest players was he could zone so well and so quickly. And once he was in that zone, he was unbeatable. But when he wasn't in the zone, it was very obvious because when Michael Jordan was playing, you know, when you're in the zone, you forget you're there. And it's just basketball. When he played and it, he wasn't in the zone, he used to miss shots galore and make a lot of mistakes because Michael Jordan's concerned about what people think and he gets nervous and, you know, misses a point because he's nervous about his shot. But in the zone, you're not. We see it. If you've got kids who play um, computer games, you'll see that when they go in the zone, they're suddenly playing spectacularly well. They're just not there. It's just, there's the game being played. And then you, you destroy things because you say, Peter, come on, dinner time, come now, immediately, come on, put that away. And of course, you pull them out of the zone. And then of course, they're furious with you because now Peter's playing, he's got performance issues and he gets killed very quickly. And now you've just wiped out his game because Peter will be beaten. But Peter in the zone won't be. 